So trying to figure out how to set up your classroom, um, how to organize the kids, how to keep the kids busy, how to make things a little bit more relatable for our little ones, was kind of things I had to figure out. And being a pilot program, I had nobody else to look at. So it was kind of trial and error for me to figure out how it was going to work. Because I spent my first couple of years with a lot of wasted class time. I really did because I felt like I was too much transition, things like that, trying to get equipment right, trying to make sure the equipment's set for this kid, make it safe for this kid, you know, work with this guy. So I did a lot of trial and error to figure out what was going to work for my classroom. So kind of give you an overall where I'm at with where I started. My whole presentation is not going to be much on competitive side of the sport. Uh, we do tons of competitive side. You know, we've, we've had quite a bit of success. We've competed in 11 state tournaments. We've won every single one of them. And uh, I'm going to give you the aspect of if you're a brand new with this program or you're looking for ways to make your classes run smoother or your practices or your program run smoother to, so you don't have wasted time. You'll be able to get kids to understand things a little better. A lot of this is going to come from an elementary perspective, if that makes sense. Because it's brand new information for fourth and fifth graders. And anybody that's worked with fourth and fifth graders in this sport or in any other classroom setting, you know there it, it's a song and dance. It really is. You're put on a performance to make sure that they're on doing what they want to do. So I'm going to take you through a whole bunch of things that I've tried, that works for us, the kids relate to, they pick up and understand easier. The, the language that I use is sometimes different than what NASC has taught you, but it's relatable stuff that works with kids, but still teaches the program the right way. Okay? So, organization is key. Being a physical educator, everything that I do is organized to a T, simply because I have my kids for 50 minutes at a time. That's it. So, if I lose five minutes here, 10 minutes here, that's a big deal for my lesson for that week with the kids, no matter what I'm teaching. So, organization is extremely important with archery because there's so much going on to keep it safe and for the kids to learn and to do. So I'll talk to you guys about the way I set up my classroom, the way I set up my equipment, and um, kind of give you guys a little things. A lot of this is real subtle. I mean super subtle, but it works for little people and it works for middle school and high school as well. Any quick reminders that'll help them remember things, especially when they're trying to learn the sport for the first time, is super important. So my classroom setup, I use different colored range lines. So instead of my waiting line and my shooting line and my target line all being the same color, I make all three of them different colors. That way they're more identifiable. Sometimes kids understand, under, understand better than hearing, okay, the waiting line, nope. The green line is the safe line, all right? Shooting line is the black line. I make my, red, my target line the red line, and I do that on purpose. Red means stop, so when we go get arrows, everybody knows we stop at the red line. So, it's little things like that that help remind them for safety areas and things like that, what they're supposed to do instead of, I can't remember, most of them don't remember, it's called the target line, no matter how many times you say it to them. All right, you might have a few kids that, I mean, they're hanging on every word, but you're dealing with nine and eight, 10 year olds, they need something a little extra to remind them. So I use colors, I live by colors with everything I do, and it, it works for the range as well. Um, the other two lines can be any color, but I want all three colors to be different, okay? I number my quivers, so when my kids come in on the first day, I explain to them, I say, this is going to be a ton of fun, but day one is kind of slow, and I apologize to them. I said, there's a lot of organizational stuff that we're going to do that's going to make it a little slow on day one, but we're going to be able to consistently teach the entire time after that. So, and we're going to learn constantly, shoot a lot, and get a lot of information into your brains. So I number my quivers, and you guys see these at tournaments and everything else, but I just put numbers on the bottom of my quivers. And then behind my waiting line in a straight line behind the quivers, I put numbers on the floor to assign tape lines. So when the kids come in, they have a assigned spot that they sit. They shoot at the same lane every time in practice. I'm not practice, but I'm sorry, my classroom. That way, we don't have any wasted time and them coming in. I want to sit by this kid. I want to sit by this kid. Nope, they have a spot. They go. That's where they're practicing from. And it saves us an immense amount of time when we're doing our trip. Um, gives each kid a lane. Let's see. And puts them right away getting started. I use a lot of different visual things with the kids. Um, you can say things a thousand times to a lot of 9, 10, 11 year olds, but sometimes they're just not going to pick up on it. So I tons and tons of reminders is what I like to call them. I said I put them everywhere in my gym, all over my archery range. We use paper clocks, and we'll talk about that later. I put those in front of my quivers on the floor. So there's reminders for what we're going to do with the paper clocks we'll talk about on the floor for them. 
I use to have my 11-step posters on the wall at the shooting line. So when they're standing at the shoot line, when they're hearing me talk or, or I'm instructing them, they can still see it on the wall. If I, hey, you got it? I'm going to move to the next kid. They can still remind themselves. I put posters on the floor. I made posters in about this big in front of every other quiver. So the kids now can see it on the wall. They can see it in front of them on the floor. There's constant reminders besides just hearing it. They can read it themselves. They can see it. So I have it everywhere. That way there's never a doubt. I tell the kids we don't ever guess. We ask questions or we look at the signs. And if you still don't know, definitely wait and ask questions. Um, I have posters of my draw positions and tee forms. So I have pictures of guys with, uh, in different color t-shirts and different draw positions. So they can refer to which draw position they need to be in. Sometimes it's easier for me to say, hey, you need to get this elbow back here, you got here, and they're not getting it because with little people, they're trying to learn that muscle connection. They just, you know, it's not that they can't do this, it's just they've never done it before. And it's, it's not a natural position, really, or movement to do archery. It's not something you normally do in your daily life. So, this is something they gotta learn to train those muscles to memorize. So, the reminders when I'm telling them, hey, get the elbow, and they're not doing it, I said, all right, look at the guy in the brown shirt. This is what your elbow looks like. Uh, this is what I want it to look like, the guy in the blue shirt. Then they can see it immediately, kind of understand what I'm talking about. So the visual works a lot of times with different kids. And I'm just, like I said, a strong believer is every kid learns different. So I'm giving them many opportunities to figure it out besides just hearing me say it. Um, I number my bows, all right, for organization. So I put numbers on the inside of my bows. So when the kids come in, I assign them a bow as well. That way we're not arguing over whose bow is going to use this one. I want the camouflage one. I want the pink one. Nope. Everybody's got an assigned number. They grab the same one. They can get to the line quickly, get to their spot, not wasting time searching for a different bow or trying to get a different one. Um, I label the poundages on my bow. Because I'm dealing with fourth and fifth graders, most of the kids can't pull back a fully cranked up bow. So I, what I do is I'm fortunate enough, I've got, I think I have 36 bows now in my program. So I take half of them and I crank them down to a, a, what I call our lighter poundage. And then I take the other ones to a medium poundage. And I label them with tape. So I'll put like colored tape on the bottom limbs. That way they're not in the visual area. And that way they know, hey, if I'm a fourth grader, I tell them, you're fourth grade, you're definitely trying the purple bow. You're trying the one with the purple tape. That's the one you're starting with. Every fourth grader should be able to handle a purple tape. If you can't, you may have to adjust every once in a while. That's usually one or two kids a year. Most everybody can handle what I set up for purple. And then for my uh, comedian one, my fifth graders, a lot of them can handle with the fifth that one. So we kind of bounce back and forth. Once I get my team going, that's when we start adjusting, making it according to what the kid can handle. Give them a little more power if they can handle it. But as far as general education class, that's what I'm getting them started on. I want them to have control first because they're learning to use those muscles. They're trying to use a stronger bow, they don't have control. That's when all the other love steps are going to be way more difficult for them to figure out. I want to keep it simple. Um, my left handed bows. When I order all my left handed bows, they're only purple, the purple paint. All my left handed bows are purple, so when the kids come up and they're trying to find the left one, they know exactly what color they have to choose. If they're not a lefty, they know they can get any color but purple. So it makes it easy for them to be able to choose which bow for right or left handed as well. And you guys, when you order, you guys can see you can order whatever color you want for right or left. So, And it's just the little things that help keep you organized, keep the class going. String bows. So, here's how I handle this, being a physical educator, is, you know, kids immediately are excited with the program and they want to immediately get into shooting that bow and arrow immediately. But I tell them it's not just as easy as that. We've got to learn these steps. We've got to go through it and start learning the muscle mind connection. So, the string bow, in my opinion, is by far the most superior teaching device that we can use, especially in the elementary division because those kids are able to go through all this without a lot of pressure, without the resistance of the bow, without pulling the weight of the bow, without having to worry about aiming at a spot. It takes away so many factors when you're trying to learn those individual steps, especially as detailed as the steps are. I know it says 11, but I'm telling you, there's, there's hundreds of steps within all of that. So string bows is key in my program. Now, as a physical educator, here's a, comp, here's a problem I ran into. When I first started this, I started with the string bows, I was making them, I was assigned each kid, had them drawn, tied off, and then I didn't want them to lose them, so I wanted them to bring them back, so I was collecting them. I was wasting so much of my class time, it was ridiculous. Just give a string bow to a kid. So I just made it simple. 
we use jump ropes. And I have tons of them in my closet. I figure we don't have the time off. This is just general. We want to get those muscles starting to understand the movements. So I just pull out jump ropes. We fold them in half so the handles are hanging down. We got a loop, and we can just pull it, just drag it through there. We don't, it's not exactly the way we do with normal string bow, and I do it with my team, but it works for the educational purposes of class of getting them to start understanding. And it's quick. Um, I plan my unit way ahead of time. So if I'm teaching, planning on teaching archery, say, in November, I begin teaching string bows at the end of September. And here's how I handle that, because I don't want to bore the kids. They're excited, they want to shoot a bow and arrow. I tell them we're starting archery, they're like, oh yeah, and I pull out jump ropes, and like, uh, but I don't want to lose them. So what I do is I teach it in chunks. So the first day, we might go over the first two or three steps of the string bow as part of our warm up in class. Maybe I'm teaching a soccer unit. I'll do five minutes of string bow for the first three steps. We'll put them away, we've got an understanding of what those are. We go on with our regular soccer unit. Comes to the next time, we add two or three more steps to it. Comes the next time, by the time we get to about third or fourth class of this, just by doing five and 10 in the warm up part, I've got them all understanding the steps and they've repeated a lot of them early um, throughout each day. By the time we get to our actual archer unit, I can say, all right, before we get up here and start going through the real stuff, everybody get your string bow, and we can go through the entire process without wasting any time. There's not a whole bunch of detailed teaching, understanding what to do. They know what to do. We're just practicing it now because we took care of all the details five and ten minutes at a time leading all the way up to that. Now, if you're not a PE teacher, how many people are in here are PE teachers? All right, so not many of us. So if you don't have the access of running your classroom the way I did this way, still use it the same way for your clubs. You can say, all right, hey, archery club or your archery team, we're going to start this in November, but we're going to do a little bit of stuff here and there beforehand. Hey, anybody interested in archery? We're going to meet before school or after school for 15 minutes before the lessons leave. We're going to go through these five to, or three or four steps. You can do that for two or three weeks and build it up there. Um, so there's ways to do it, but I'm telling you, doing it in chunks keeps them more interested. They want a little bit more. They want to understand a little bit more. Um, and, I, and it doesn't take a whole lot of time, okay? So I utilize experienced archers with this, and this is, this is super important to me, and it transitions into my team. And this is, I, I believe, I mean, we shoot well, we do well, and I, I think the purpose of our shooting well more than anything is, is our team aspect that I teach my kids. And this is where it starts, and it starts in my general ed classroom. Um, I take my fifth graders that were on my team the year before, and I'll go up, knock on the door in the middle of class, and I'll pull them out of class. The teacher will let me pull them out of class, and I bring them down to work with my fourth graders while I'm teaching string bow. So they'll come down for five, ten minutes to that warm up, start helping kids with string bow stuff, and puts them in a leadership position, allows me to break them up into smaller groups, allows me to be able to walk in, help each one of them, and it allows them to give them a little bit more one on one. When they feel like they're in that, 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 that position, they can pull out of class, it's a privilege. And now they feel they're really important. And fourth graders immediately like, I want to do that next year. So they're taking all that in. They want to get part of the team. They want to get pulled out of class. They want to come down and be a leader and help. And it is a huge tool. I didn't realize it would be as great as it is. It's benefited all aspects of my whole orchard, archery target program inside the class, after school, my teams, everything. Size ways makes your, makes kids grow. So um, I also teach in a variety of formats with my uh, straight bows. So when I first start, I do mass groups. So everybody's in one big mass group. I'm talking, I'm talking through, I'm walking through, and um, I'm helping everybody individually bit by bit until we get to that big picture. And then I'll take them through as a mass group. Once we got the mass part done, I break them up into small groups. That's when my fifth graders start coming a little bit more often. They can get smaller groups. And then I can start peeling my fifth graders. All right, you step back. Let's get the fourth grader up there. They're going to now going to have to coach through everybody. And the reason I do this, besides leadership position, as you guys know, not everybody learns the same. And as a coach, I learn something new almost every single time I'm teaching the kids because I'm watching them. So when you're a coach on the other side and you're watching, oh, that's what he meant. Now I see it. And for high school and middle school, they pick that stuff up quick. Elementary kids, light bulbs come on left and right when you see this. They're, they're seeing a whole different perspective. So I do small groups, and then we go to partners as well. So now it's more one-on-one. -on -one. They got a lot more time. They don't have to look at four or five kids. They can look at one person. They can check. I tell them we look at all positions. So I got kids that are watching from this side. They come to the front of them. They go behind them. Now they can see angles and straight lines and 
uh, T form and everything the way it's supposed to be, the way they're anchoring, the way they're drawing. They can see from all angles, they can take time, and we, uh, we work with partners constantly. I try to make them pick somebody that they don't normally hang with. So that gives them a little bit more responsibility. Hey, they're counting on me to do this, and I'm not going to move off at my front. Uh, finally, the last one I have up there is while at the shooting line, and I do this primarily with my team. Um, I want my team to be practicing the same way the string bows that they would compete with. So I blow whistles. They walk to the line. They put their string bow on their toe, and we go through the whole process with whistle commands, five arrows with a string bow, the same process, pretending to take an arrow, everything exactly the same. I want them to try to get that muscle memory created with everything they're doing. So we do everything like at the shooting line with my team. So it's another way that we use string bows quite a bit. But I can't illustrate enough how important it is with any age drill, but the little guys especially. So teaching us on the 11 steps, kind of with all this, and basically you guys, inside out and backwards, you guys know these steps. Um, or if you're new to the program, you're, you're starting, you're really familiar with it. But what I'm going to do with you this is I'm going to go through most of it. I'm going to explain kind of the ways that I do it in forms of my, 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 my language with it. Oops, sorry. And uh, how I tell it to kids so that they can kind of make it more understanding to them. Um, like I said, it's uh, everybody learns different and little people need a song and dance or something silly to relate to. So my stance, I always tell the kids when they come up there because never fails. You have three-fourths of the kids, you ask them to straddle the line, they all stand right on the line facing the target this way. You know, you have the two kids that are gymna gymnasts that understand the word straddle, and they'll straddle the line. So instead of using the word straddle, I still use it, but I tell them straddling the line means you're riding a motorcycle or you're going to ride a horse. Pretend the shooting line is your motorcycle. We don't want to do tricks on the archery range, so no feet on the line. So we're not doing tricks on the motorcycle. So the kids know they put one foot on each side, they're riding that horse or their motorcycle. Fix it up quick. Uh, second thing is we start with our open stance, of course, and we talk about we just slide front toe back so it evens up with the middle toe and just point it out. We want to be in a powerful position, I tell them, because immediately they're, they want to just stand there and relax. I, I want them immediately in a powerful position, especially little people. I have fourth graders that are this tall, so we got to get them up. I want them to be as big as they can, so they're immediately standing there in a powerful, dominating position. I said, if you're slouching, show fear. We want to be tall and strong. So I want to posture immediately started before we even blow a whistle. Um, we stare at the target. So that's getting their minds, their bodies prepped, trying to get their body under control, focusing. There's a lot that I'm going to teach in my Tom. So there's so much you got to take in. So your mind's got to be just as ready to learn as your body does. So there's preparing their mind to have them stand at target in a tall position ready to go with that straddle line. And we don't move feet. I tell them we don't want happy feet. We save that for the penguins in the movies. So we want to keep those feet till. I tell them when they're shooting, they have two things to do at the beginning and the end. First one, they look at their feet, make sure it's exactly the way they've been learning the whole time. When they're done with their fifth arrow, they look at their feet again and make sure those feet are in the same exact place. Um, I'm fortunate enough my gym is tile floor in my elementary. So I tell them we're going to use those lines of tiles. Remember where those feet are according to where the quiver is, the tile lines are, so you can make sure it's always in the same place related to the shooting line. Um, if you have a wooden floor, you can use the planks. If you're on a floor that has just flat concrete, then they, they have to start really looking at the shooting line and the quiver accordingly. But I tell them, any advantage you can, spaces on the floor, right, stance is everything. If you're fast your foundation, I tell them, your stance is good, the rest of it's going to be good. So when knocking the air out, which is this, you know, subtly, they always tell palm down, grabbing backwards, which is great. I tell my kids, palms waving to the waiting line. So we wave to the waiting line. So if they grab the arrow this way, back of their hands towards it, they know they got their hand the wrong way. I want them waving to the waiting line that way, same way when they pick it up, arrow points directly to the target the entire time, bring it up and over, knock it, all the same rules with the odd feather facing it. Okay, but we always wave to the waiting line. Um, uh, the last thing on that is I always tell them to focus because they immediately want to put it on that rest first. Mm -hmm. And I always tell them, we're going to knock the arrow on the string first, and then it'll go on the, the I'm sorry, knock it on the string first, it'll go on the rest. Super easy after that. And after they do that a couple times, they're like, okay, yeah, that was much easier. But they immediately want to put it on there, they start sliding it, try to angle it, falls off, put it back on. So tell them to keep it simple, string first, and then we put it on there. Anybody any questions so far? Am I going too fast? All right. So setting the draw hands. 
This is where I use those paper clocks I mentioned earlier. So, I'm sorry, I'll take it back, not yet, I'm sorry. I'm gonna draw hands, this is where we use our, we use three fingers, we use that first groove, and what I wanna tell my kids, and this is the biggest mis common mistake I have with the elementary guys with this part, is because it's so much, it's a new movement, it's difficult for them to pull back. Um, they wanna make a fist and ball up and grip that string as tight as it can so they can pull it with as much power in their hand. So, it makes it terribly difficult to relax, I'm sorry, to release, so I tell the kids we want long, extended hands. We want our hands flat, we want to like make it feel like the bones are stretching out. So, a lot of kids will still, they're like, feel like they got straight, I said, no, let it stretch. See how stretched out your hand can get. And hearing the word stretched, I, I started doing that like three years ago, and it went from light bulb for me, I'm like, why did I never say that before, you know? So, it's just little things that they all sudden relate to. Hey, let the bone stretch out, let them hang in there like a hook. And I always tell the kids, we don't pull the hook. The hook is there to hold on. So we hold on with the hook. We're going to draw it back um, to our, I'm sorry, let's see. My fingers just hold it. We stretch them out. The fingers are going to lightly touch the arrow. Um, they immediately want to put them all the way up there. The arrow falls off right away. So I tell them to lightly kiss the arrow with your fingers. All right, something silly, but something they remember. So they just lightly kiss them is what we do. Um, when we set our bow hand, this is where we use the clocks. So I have those clocks laying down, the quiver's on the floor there. Sorry, they're kind of small. And um, what I do is, a lot of the kids, everybody knows we want to have that thumb pointing um, in that 45, the knuckles in that 45 degree angle, so that thumb's pointing to the side, not straight up. So. Kids, when I tell them a 45 degree angle, or hey, hold it in your lifeline, they're like, hey, I see a lifeline, but as soon as they put the bow on there, they're like, nowhere clear. They have no idea. Trying to figure out how to hold it on that thumb is a lot of jargon that they just have trouble understanding. So the way I relate it to is we use a clock. You know, I have the clock on the floor. I have them set the draw hand, we'll point it straight down, and I have them open that bow hand completely. When they open that bow hand completely, I see if you open your hand up and this thumb is pointing 12 or one, you know that that's in the wrong position. We need that thumb to turn to two o'clock. That's gonna rotate everything to that position. And then we lightly close the top fingers. I said we should have space underneath that you can fit a marker or something to hold in place in there. If we're gripping all the way in, that turns everything back to that one o'clock, 12 o'clock position. So once they, it takes them a while. This is a hard one for little people. It is so hard because they're just wanting to grip and hold on. But this is one way that's helped me a lot is we just look at it, thumb goes to two o'clock. If you're lefty, thumb goes to 10 o'clock, okay? Um, let's see. And again, you know, that's when they can start understanding how to get to the pad of that thumb and, and get it in the right place. Our pre-draw, when we do our pre-draw, we're gonna raise the bow up calmly in a tall position. So as we started with our stance and we got to that line, I want them to be in that powerful position. So they immediately should have good posture. They've got everything set, they got the bow head set, they got good posture, they're ready to go. And then I want them to bring it up into a powerful position as well. So a lot of kids, you guys know, that bow is heavy for them. They're going to come up and they're going to be shrinking down. They're going to be holding this way. I want a powerful position. I tell elbow up gives them power. And they're going to stand tall. I want them to reach towards the target with both hands. Because you guys, they'll come up and want to bring it up to here. We want to reach to the target. I tell them to extend, but don't bend. We don't want to bend our hips. We want to stay tall, but extend those hands to the target. So we extend, we don't bend. We draw back and we're going to anchor to that corner and smile from that position. That elbow up is going to give us a powerful position to work from instead of a lot of these. You know, you know we got your modeling hips where they're sitting here. We don't want modeling hips. I tell them to say that for the magazine. We're staying tall and strong for our tree. So we extend, but we don't bend the body. Um, draw. So when we draw, like I mentioned, elbows up and we want our abs tight. I tell my guys, I want us to be, I want us to have our stomach muscles tight, but I don't want them to hold their breath. All right, so they understand that. I say, okay, tighten them up, breathe in and out. We breathe a little bit so they start understanding how to work those muscles, kind of like doing sit ups, and pulling pulling out. But we put that elbow up tight, tall for power. We draw that, keep those abs tight, and we're going to keep those fingers and that hook long. All right, we talk about we got it set, we're going to keep that hook long. Fingers extended the whole time, going to keep them stretched out. So when I pull, I'm going to pull at the elbow. Kids immediately want to try to pull at that hand. When they do that, they grip completely with a fist, and they're going to pull with that hand. So to avoid that, 
I just tell them we're going to drive back with the elbow, and our back shoulder is going to roll behind us. That's going to get everything back where it needs to go without balling up that hand and making a big fist. Um, we're going to squeeze those shoulder blades together. And, you know, I hear a lot of uh, coaches talking to you to squeeze a tennis ball. I tell my kiddos we got a lemon and an orange. We're going to squeeze a little bit of lemon juice or orange juice out of there. So it gives them a little visual of what they're trying to hold, squeezing it back there. And um, I always have my guys, especially my little ones, when they're learning to not draw slow. It's going to create fatigue. It's going to slow them down. It's going to make them more tired. It's going to start developing some bad habits in the long run. So we draw back with power. But I don't want you to be confused on that. I don't want it to be jerking out of control. It's in that powerful position. We pull back strong, and then we get there. So it's still control, but we're doing it not slowly, but more with power. Okay? Because like I mentioned, most of them say, I can't pull it back. It's not that they can't. They just haven't learned to use the muscles the right way. Once they start learning how to use those muscles the right way, they can usually drop back and pound the I have set. So angry. We use the tip of the finger to our uh, index finger to the corner of the smile like Nash teaches. But the big mistake, once you get kids keeping those fingers spread out, the one small mistake they finally start making once they get here is they curl the tips of the fingers backwards so they're going towards their ear back here. It makes it even more difficult to let go. So I went saw I tell my kiddos I want the tips of the fingers to point towards my face. So the tip of my finger is touching the corner of my smile, not my knuckles. So my fingers are pointing backwards to my ears. So you want to make sure the tips of the fingers are pointing towards the corner of the smile. Keeps the fingers long. Um, keeping the fingers long gets that thumb out of the way as well. All right. I know there's different points of anchor contact. It's a little bit more difficult to find three and four points when uh, when you got a little bit of hands. So you gotta get creative with stuff. So we keep it simple when we're first learning. Um, I tell my kiddos, bring the string to their face. Don't bring your face to the string, because you'll see that a lot too, especially when they're learning to develop the muscles. They'll get here and they'll wanna pull everything here and it shortens everything. I tell them, you're in a powerful position from the beginning to the end. So you stay here in your position, powerful and dominant, and you bring everything to your face. We don't wanna alter what we've already developed and practiced or, or, or get set up. We want to bring everything to my position. I don't want to bring my position to the string. Um, that will then create our T form. I tell my kids this is the law in this sport. It's the law in everything that we do with this is our T form. Once we get in that T position, this is what we're working for. This is everything that we're trying to achieve with our steps here. We want this position to create our straight lines so we have this T form so we can be as consistent and as accurate as possible. So if, when we talk about, you know, why is my arrows not going here and there, a lot of times, this new guys, it's not about aim. It's about these 11 steps and getting their form in the right position. So we're trying to get those muscles to learn where we want it to be. So we draw back and we really hammer, hammer, hammer hard that that's the law of the sport. We need that T form in order to be able to develop to the next round or the next step or level. Our aim, and this is usually the last thing that I really, really kind of go on. I mean, we talk about what we need to do with it, but we don't get much details. In fact, I don't give the kids much details until we really start getting structurally good with our 11 steps. We do close the opposite eye. If I have kids that can't wink or close their opposite eye, I've had several, I put an eye patch on them. Um, I've had girls that's bedazzled theirs and guys that's made theirs look tough and whatever they wanted to do, but it, it works for them and they're passionate higher while they shoot. And then um, we use the tip of the arrow um, when we're shooting. So we learn to focus that, that, that visual on there. And then we aim small and miss small. What I mean by that is a lot of kids will go up there and they'll, I'm like, okay, so where are you aiming? I'm aiming right here. I'm like, okay, so if you miss that area, you're now even farther away. So if you aim at this spot and you miss that spot, we're still fairly close. So we aim small and miss small. And I'm pretty extreme with my kids. The way I want them to visualize that is I tell them that your aim spot needs to be the size of a ballpoint pen, the very tip of it. And they're looking at me like, there's no way. I'm like, I can keep it that small. I was like, that's how small it needs to be. So the harder they focus on that, the smaller it is, the more it draws into what they want to keep it there. So aim small and miss small. Ballpoint pen, tip of it is kind of the cues that we use with that. And it helps. And then we try to keep things steady as possible. They know, I tell them, there's no way you're going to be able to keep your body completely steady. It's just impossible. So we're trying to be as steady as possible. Let it float until we get to our spot and go. And then pretend the target is a clock when we're talking about our aim. 
this helps these guys a lot. And I think a lot of coaches use this already. But for just general ed classes and things like that, if the kids are around understanding where to aim, I'm like, okay, pretend it's a clock. And if you are, if you need to hit, uh, aim at 12 o'clock or at 3 o'clock so they can relate to where they need to aim. So if they're missing high, I can say, all right, let's move it down towards 6 o'clock, this area between the blue to the right, or 4 o'clock, or between here. So any visual that they can use to help them with that immensely helps. We also use uh, those little stickers for garage sales, fluorescent stickers. We put those on there so they can get it steady on those spots. That helps a lot too. They like putting the stickers on there and um, shooting their groups that way or starting learner groups that way. Uh, let's see. Um, our shot setup. I do this a little bit different than what NASP preaches. Um, shot setup, in my opinion, is the most complicated part of this for no one as you can understand because they're that, that push and go at the same time and trying to make it stay steady is, is it difficult. That's an advanced, advanced thing for a fourth or fifth grader, in my opinion. It's not that they can't do it, it just it takes a lot of time. So when you're going through your general starting your program and learning, this isn't something I hammer hard on. I use this shot setup as more of a checklist for the kids to slow them down. What I want to do is they think they've got all these steps, but again, they're still learning, developing the muscle memory. So when they're here, before they've let that go, I tell them to shot set up as a checklist. I want them to go through, hey, is the elbow in the right place? My teeth form good? My steady? My, form, my feet still still? That's their chance to go through all those steps again, to double check before they let that air loose. So that's how I use that. Once I get to my team, then we start going into more of the detail of what the shot set up really is. But that's how I use it in my class. Um, release and follow through. I tell my kiddos, we want our fingers to turn into feathers. We want to keep our teeth warm while we do it, so our fingers are going to turn into a paintbrush, but we let them relax like they're feathers. So we go fingers to feathers, and we just come back and hold that teeth warm. I tell them I want them to see the arrow travel and hit the target while watching it with the bow up through a window. So they got to hold their window up in order to see the bow or the arrow hit the target. Because a lot of the kids immediately want to fold and go down. I said we don't want to close the door. I want to close the window. We want to keep the window open and watch the arrow hit the target. So watching it all the way to the target is key to helping them learn that muscle structure because that bow is heavy and um, helps them keep that position a lot longer. So we paint the cheek and I relate to that as well with a tug of war um, analogy. I tell the kids if I'm playing tug of war with you and I let go, what's going to happen to them? And of course they tell me they're going to fall down. So I said it's the same principle with the bow string. If you got here and the tension of the string is pulling like tug of war and you relax your fingers and go, your hands naturally should just fall back. I said, I don't want you to pull it back. I want it to naturally fall back. Let it turn into feathers. Like it's tug of war. You just lost your balance because the tension is now gone. So those are things that are relatable because there's silly things that kids do anyway, right? So um, we hold all that position all the way through. And then finally reflect, this is, this is hard for them, but once they start getting some success, they really, really start taking this part serious. Um, I want them to reflect while they're holding their T position. And simply because, like I said, I want them to see the arrow hit the target. I want them to be able to look or feel where their hand position is at. Because when they're first learning, you're going to get a lot of this, this, and this, and this. So I tell them once they let go of the arrow, they got to hold it. Now they got information they can learn from. They can see, okay, my hand's up here. So we check hand position. We check elbow position, shoulder position. We check bow and arm position. All these things are things they can visually see themselves without me standing there and saying, hey, you're not doing this. This is something that they can see themselves and they can correct themselves and start learning from. Um, and the other thing is the feeling of the muscles. And this is the one thing I tell them I can't do for you. This is a part that you have to reflect on your own because the feeling of everything is super important in this sport. The way it feels and how it goes is what's creating those muscle memories. We want to be able to feel it in that position. I'll have some kids that are, I'm trying to help adjust or do things, and I'll stop them, and I'll say, all right, hold it there, feel it. I said, don't think about anything but the feeling, the way the muscles are all right now. And then we'll come back together, and then we'll do it again. I said, feel it. Let's talk about the feeling. And I want them to learn that feeling after the release as well. So we hold, keep it there so they feel those muscles as well, so they know what it feels like to be in a proper position when they release and follow through. Anybody any questions? All right. So 
we also reflect, I'm sorry, we also reflect on uh, the travel of the arrow and where the arrow hits. So once they start getting a little bit more advanced and getting comfortable with this and trying to figure out how to get those groups a little better, I tell them they need to watch the arrow. If it's going side to side or up and down like a dolphin, all this stuff is important stuff that they can tell me so I can help them if I'm working with another kid at that time. They can start understanding what it means to be able to correct those things. Where it hits as well, we're trying to develop those groups. And uh, I tell the kids, we're not worried about bullseyes. Bullseyes aren't important. We shoot a lot of blank bail with you know, no, no rings at all sometime at the very beginning because I want them to start learning how to get the arrows in the same area because I want the 11 steps and the muscle positions correct. I tell them once everything's done with the 11 step, the aiming part and the groups, the bullseyes will be easy. That's the easy part, but that's the last step. So watching the arrows, where they're traveling, where they're going, is super important to their information that they can gain every time they shoot and learning the process. I do have time. All right. So I got 10 minutes, I think, or 20 minutes, maybe. All right, so this is another key. This has been, uh, this by far has been one of the most important things I've ever done with this program. Um, I utilize teaching assistants, and these are parents. I sent out an email, I did this, gosh, this is like the fifth year I've done this program, and I was trying to figure out how to be able to get the kids more time and more practice. So what I did is I sent out, I sent out a letter to every parent in the school. I said, anybody interested in learning the sport of archery? Anybody interested in have free time during the school day that would like to help with my classes? And if so, you know, I put my information on there, and I set up a training after school. So I held an after school training after school for just parents that wanted to do this and help me out. What I did with that training is I treated them like they were the kids in my class. I went through the entire process, taught them the same way. That means we went string bows for the first half hour of it. We went through all the different steps and understanding how the string bow and the way it felt. Same way I talked to the kids. And then I went up, they had a shoot. I had my parents shoot, go through the whole thing, treat them like the kids the whole thing. Once they got through and they were comfortable in the process of shooting, what it felt like, what the kids would be going through when they're shooting, and in the learning aspect, because some parents had never picked up a bow before when they come in here and do this with me, and gives them an idea of what the kids are going through when they're up there trying to learn this. I then spent the last part of the training of just telling them what I expected out of them if they were coming to help me in class. So basically, they knew that they weren't going to be like lead instructors, but it took a lot off of my mind knowing that I got three or four parents that are watching kids carry arrows, pull arrows right away, and the parents, they're more adamant on them than I am sometimes. Because I mean, I know, you know, I, I teach PE, you know, we get a little wonker sometimes, but still, we work as professional as we can, but the parents are on them all the time. Hey, you can't just, I mean, right away. Which was great for me because I could relax and help kids with more individualist stuff that I normally couldn't do because I was worried about making sure this dude was under control here at the line, carrying zeros back, behaving behind the weight line, all those little things. So it gave me, not police, but it almost gave me more, um, more help with keeping my range calm, relaxed, gave me more individual time than kids that needed. There's always that one or two kids in your group or your class that needs special attention. Um, so that allowed me to be able to do that. Or I even could say, hey, I, do you mind sticking with this kid? You know, they're having a lot of trouble. They, they need a little extra attention. And they would hang with them. A constant reminder, remember, you have the arrow this way. So it's all the little detail things that they're going through. And here's the greatest part about the whole thing is the first year I did it, parents loved it. And then I think three of the parents that did it that year, two of them were kindergarten kids' parents. So I had those parents help me for the next six years. So they ended up, by the time they were, their kids were fourth and fifth graders, they knew how to teach this pretty good. So I had extra coaches within my classroom during the school day. And I had, so I, I had three or four different teaching parents with me almost every class. And it helped immensely. And I think that is why we grow as fast as we do with my program, because I got more eyes, more attention, more details. And now I've got, I probably over the past 10, 15 years, I've probably had 40, 50 parents involved with my PE classrooms. And I have two, their kids are now graduated from high school, they still come back and help me every year. It's pretty cool, yeah. Do you ask them not to work with their kid? Absolutely, so, and they know that, especially if the kids are on the team, I tell them, I got your kid that way. And what I, the reason I tell them that is because moms and dads have different expectations for their kids than coaches do. And uh, for them to understand that it's hard, and I said, what is really, really good in your mind 
I'm sorry, what is really poor in your mind or upsetting in you might be a big, big breakthrough for what my, my eyes are seeing. So discouraging them from that is, is key. So it does help. And then, you know, you got a class or a group of 24 plus kids, there's plenty of kids for them to work with, so it's never an issue. Um, so they assist with my PE classes, they assist with my after school clubs, um, allows for more one on ones. We talked about or struggling, I can allow some more eyes in the range. And um, it, it, it puts a little bit more, uh, puts your mind a little bit more at ease. Because when, especially when you're teaching new fourth graders. So you get more, more adult eyes that get some experience. It makes a big difference. So here's the keys to always remember when you're doing this. Not all kids learn the same. All right? That's why I have as many different opportunities to explain, to show them, to see things, to hear it from me, to see it from other kids, from other parents. Every which way I can get them an opportunity to learn, I'm trying to throw it on them. As well as, and I'm the type of person, I talk constantly. I'm constantly repeating everything I'm teaching in class. And I always tell my wife, when R2 starts, I'm going to be exhausted because I'm going to be teaching so hard. And that's why I always tell her, I'm, I'm teaching hard because I'm constantly talking and repeating. The more they hear it, the more it's going to start sinking in. Uh, what is it they say, like, you want to hear some, kids need to hear something seven times before they finally start remembering part of it. So I'm just constantly saying it and saying it and saying it. Um, I tell them we'll learn the big chunks, and then once we start getting through it, then they can start getting the little details and the finer things that we talked about with some of that stuff. Uh, we use many verbals, you know, the verbal and the ways. Um, uh, phrases and words need to be kid-related with little people, I think. You know, I mean, the NAS program and everything you teach, it's awesome. That sometimes it's not easy to understand for little people. So putting in terms for them to understand, it's the same thing. It's just a way for them to relate to it better. And I feel like I get through my kids better by just doing silly little quirky things all the time. Um, I keep things slow. It's a slow process. Everybody wants to learn it fast, and you want to get your kids going through, oh my gosh, only a 10 minutes. It's not worth it to ever rush. Because what that does is starts developing bad habits. So it's a slow process. Keep it slow. Remember, they're gonna they're eventually gonna advance faster because of the slow process. Um, tell them to never guess what to do. I, I tell them after everybody's been individually trained by myself or one of my coaches or one of my my parents, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna blow a whistle for the first time where everybody's gonna shoot on their own. I said you got a question or you're not sure about something, you can't remember, should you guess? And they're like, no. I said, you raise your hand. I said, because it makes it an unsafe situation for everybody in class or yourself or the equipment or it develops bad habits. Bad habits in this sport are tough to fix. So we want to start with good habits and develop good habits from the beginning. Um, there's a lot of information, so focus on the core and then the details like I mentioned before. And create good habits because bad ones are hard to break. And then, of course, keep it fun. Celebrate the small successes. Um, I got a had I had my camp this week. Uh, I just finished my camp Thursday before I came down here, and I had a kiddo that literally missed the target 90% of the time. But by the last day, I think he missed the target twice out of about eight rounds. So it was a huge day because everything was hit the target. So uh, the small success is what's going to keep kids interested. And the development and the growth from fourth to fifth grade is mind-blowing. Uh, some kids I'm like in fourth grade, I'm like, there's no way they're going to be able to handle this on a team in fifth grade. There's, they're not going to be good. They end up being some of the best shoes I ever had in fifth grade. All of a sudden, they, as things start clicking. They remember from the year before, uh, the kids that do my little extra camp or little extra things, it's amazing. The more the information is presented to them, how much faster they learn. And put them in that leadership position allows them to be able to develop the skills so much faster as well. And the great part about this is if you're planning on competing and creating a team, all this now will transition to that. And you've got a solid foundation to build your team from. And I honestly, I feel like that's why my teams have been so successful, because of our foundation in the classroom and how we developed this. All right. Anybody got any questions? There's my information if you guys want to jot down. Yes? Uh, a couple of things. I, I love it that we have elementary school <coughs> teachers teaching it diligently because by the time they are high school. Absolutely. Like where they learn it. Um, how long is your unit in class? And then what have you seen the impact of your 15 years of teaching archery spread through the county or through your school system 
Yes, great question, because I've seen it from the beginning because I was in the pilot program. So um, as far as... Um, I said I asked a question, would you repeat it? So yes, I'm sorry. So the question again was, um, sorry, there's two parts. What was the first part? I'm sorry. How long is your unit? Oh, how long, how long is my, my, my unit in class? And uh, I see my kids once a week, sometimes twice a week, and on a rotating Friday for 50 minutes. So I usually do my unit for about three to four weeks. So I see my kids anywhere between three to four hours of instruction. And this is the main unit. This is not my lead up of warm up time. I've done 15, 20 minutes. That ends up adding up to a couple hours by the time we get to that point. So it ends up uh, taking about three, three and a half weeks to get through as a unit itself. Um, as far as the development over my 15 years of doing this, I've got kids that have been doing it in the fourth grade in my school, and they still are doing it as a senior in the high school. I have kids that are uh, former uh, students of mine that were former athletes on my team, some of the best shooters I had. I bring them back as freshmen in high school to be peer coaches. So I have peer coaches that come back and help coach my team. Um, you wouldn't believe the respect those kids earn. Uh, cool story with that is the first kid that was on my first two teams, she ended up being the women's state overall champion in her fifth grade year, or sixth grade year. And uh, she came back coach with me. She's now a PE teacher. She's doing top with me this year. She just finished camp and she did, uh, she's got a, a new job that she's gonna be teaching PE and she's gonna start an archery program in her middle school now. So it's like it's come full circle for me, you know? And uh, as far as it's spreading, as far as programs in our area, it started with my school and one other in our district. And little by little, we started doing a little bit more. So, hey, let's have a little district tournament between the two of us. Another school did, we had three of us. And the next thing you know, Missouri Conservation wanted to start a state tournament. Like, yeah, I'll go down. We'll see what happens. Let's we'll go down and do it. We ended up going down and doing really well and won the thing. And after that, caught like wildfire. I mean, we, we couldn't keep kids from not wanting to do archery. And now, I think there's five elementary in our district. We have 11 total, but five have the program. All three, no, I'm sorry, all four of our middle schools have it, and both of our high schools have it. And I had to work hard because I was like focusing on the schools that my kids feed into so I wanted them to continue all the way through but uh it's it's still going I got kids I got two new coaches that are starting this year and I got two that graduated last year and they still come back and help me I had my camp was awesome because I had I had myself and eight coaches that had been with me all these years that are either graduates or still in high school that came back I had 20 kids in the line I had two kids per coach almost the entire time it's amazing how fast they learn because of it and this is Kids that are brand new picking up a bow for the first time. By the end of the week, like I said, the poor guy was missing all week. By the end of the week, he missed like two or three arrows in the last day. So, huge, huge gains in a matter of four days span, like four, five, six hours. Yeah. Um, I really love all the, the visual reminders and, and, and all, mm -hmm. those are all time savers. Yes. Time saver. but, uh, this last year, I tried two new things. Um, I had a fourth grade class with 15 kids in it. 50 one, or 15? One on 15 for 30 okay. minutes twice a week. So one of the things that did all the streaming board work, I had luxury of having uh, weight rooms right next to where we were. Awesome. We went in the weight room, I put tape on the floors, put foot positions on the floors. They're looking in the mirror to yep. do the, all the streaming board work. I did put targets, so they're looking at targets. Cool. The uh, second thing was during the draw hand set, and also for the anchor, um, I started making uh, real strong references to either an eagle claw or a crochet hook. And brought in a crochet hook and took the, the, the sharp part of it off there. Love it. To put it, and then use that crochet, the tip of the crochet hook in, in the corner of the mouth also. For the awesome. They're really successful. That's awesome. I love it. Thank you for sharing. Yes, ma'am. You said you had, you had your kids once or twice a week. How many students do you have in your class? My class is in fourth and fifth grade, usually max out anywhere between. 21 to 24, 25 kids. Um, our school district does a really good job of keeping classroom numbers at a manageable, you know, learning environment, which is great. Um, but I do, I do sometimes go a little above and beyond, and I'll if I have free time, like at my lunch or at the end of my planning time at the end of the day, the fifth graders are at recess. I may go to the teacher and say, "Hey, your kids want to miss recess today? Come down and shoot archery next day." And a lot of times, they'll be like, yeah, we don't want to recess. We'll come down and we'll go to the gym. So I'll sometimes take the recess time. I'll ask them if they want to give it up, and they will. And we'll get a little extra practice sometimes during that time, too. So uh, it's just management of the time is key. 
There's it's, it holds so much information for little guys. And if you can manage your time, you can get more information to them. And the more they see it, the more they hear it, the more they the more they can uh, feel it and do it, the faster they're gonna learn. And uh, being on there and instilling the proper things is what's going to help them develop the good habits from the beginning. And uh, it is a lot of work. It is a lot of work.